five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they they make um, adapters for microphone arms that you can mount cameras on. And since microphone arms are generally longer mm -hmm. than the chintzy webcam arms yeah. and heavier duty, um, I just buy the microphone arms and the $10 adapters and I have some things to much more high quality and yeah. I can move cameras everywhere. Yeah, I hate my, that's really smart. Yeah, I hate my uh, microphone arm. It's like, it's just under power. Like I bought the cheap one. And yeah. so I definitely need to get a beefier one. Yeah. But I like that idea of just putting your camera system because then you can just like you put your camera close and then when you're done with it, you can just kind of swing it away because I love to be able to do exactly. it with the microphone. Right? Like my yeah. microphone is only in front of me when I'm recording and then I just shift it away and, and get on with my life. And you're reminding me I need to open my recording software. Yeah. So I, 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 many things on arms and i just love the fact that i essentially have a transformer for a desk flip this monitor over there move this microphone over there that's cool and yeah yeah yeah, yeah and, well at least i've gone down to two monitors from four and they're sort of closer to me now so i'm not like looking all the way around anymore like i'm doing <laughs> uh yeah i've got two monitors one like a 30 inch 39 no 39 inch 40 yeah. inch like a dell 42 inch so i've got like a really nice big dell uh 4k uh -huh. and then i've got a lower resolution but it's 144 megahertz for games so <laughs> but i use them both like at the same time as yeah. the, as the desktop between the two so i they, the Planetary Science Institute got me a pair of amazing monitors that were far larger than I asked for. And you can't complain about that. That is an amazing no. thing to have happen. And I realized I really hated having the crease of the monitors in the center. And I had a LG 29 inch wide uh, QHD just hanging around. And so it's vertical in the center. Mm -hmm. And then I have the two bigger monitors curving around me, and I basically just build monitor forts the way other people build blanket right, forts. Right. Yeah. 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 I've. I've. Th there's these really cool new curved monitors too that I'm super tempted. I was like when I was sort of getting this big Dell monitor, I was like, oh, those are cool because then it does just wrap around you a bit. People are like stacking two of them on top of each other. Yeah. I love. I mean, monitors are are have gotten so less expensive now like you could buy a really good monitor for 150 dollars 200 yeah. yeah i i um upstairs in in my office um i i discovered i have a carbon monoxide problem down here not carbon monoxide carbon, monoxide? carbon dioxide yeah. so if i work down here all day i kill my brain um I like my brain. And now you so, can actually measure this scientifically? Yeah, exactly. yeah. I have a, a sensor. I can watch how quickly it goes up. Do you have a fan? Sorry, I'm just, uh, I've yes. mentioned that. Yeah, okay, good. good. I, I do have a fan. I turned it off when we're recording because otherwise right. I get yelled at. Um, yeah. But for the amount of time that we record, it doesn't start getting to, it doesn't get out of the you're fine levels as long right. as I like come down to record and then run away. So I'm setting up upstairs so that I can work up there more. And it's just, I yeah. can have air conditioning in the summer. And I realized I only had, and these are first world gamer problems. I only had an HD monitor up there. And that's not acceptable. No. Well, I mean, it's acceptable as long as it's got a high megahertz speed rate. Like you, 60 megahertz is now like nice you so the so the issue that i ran into is like i cannot make slack small enough that it's not eating too much of my screen right so you need the higher pixel density to actually lay everything out and work effectively so i discovered you can get um like qhd which is the the yeah, 2440 that's, that's the resolution that i've got on my second monitor <clears throat> yeah, so I I picked up a gamer one for like two thirty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're not that expensive. Yeah. No. The four K is pretty astonishing. You do the four K is the same as like four HD yeah. TV HD that, screens. That's what these are. Yeah. Yeah. These. Oh my god. Um. Okay. So did you see the helicopter fly? 
I did. I'm I'm so sad at when the videos cut off because you don't get the smooth motion. So if you've seen the video, you see swirly, 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 and I think you catch part of it going up. You see it up. Yeah. Sort of and jiggling back gap. and forth. Yeah. 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 And, then and it's sort of like you see it sort of doing this a little bit and yeah. then it lands. Yeah. <laughs> And and so that that gap where you don't get to see the are we gonna land and yep. hold your breath and everything. I was very sad yep. that just the the readout times of the chip meant that we didn't get all of that. Yeah. Uh, in in the ground, on in the air, on the ground again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Not in the ground. That would be bad. Hal McKinney is asking: Can virtual interviews be set up so you look like you're facing each other, like you're in the same room? Yes, if we had bigger green screens. Yeah, you could, but I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I can see how it's sort of weird because we're both looking at you, the, the listener, as opposed to us looking at each other. So I set up my camera so that when I'm looking at you, I'm actually like turning my head to look at your direction on the screen. And I have always done that. Mm -hmm. But then you're not looking. Yeah. So you see, I don't even look at you. I look into the camera. Yeah, I know. I know. There. And that's, and when, I'm not even looking at, see, that's the camera that, that you're using, uh -huh. but that's the camera that the audience is using. So you don't, <laughs> you don't see it. Right. And, and when we're doing astronomy cast, I don't look at you, but pre-show and post-show, I will look at you. Right. No. So I've, I've just completely trained myself to look, even though I, I'm only looking into the camera, I'm not actually looking at you. I'm seeing you in my periphery, but I'm not actually looking at you. Right. Which is uh, sort of a hard trick to to maintain but it makes it it creates the illusion of the fact that we're uh, that we're looking at each other um but yeah i don't i don't know i mean i don't know if, has anybody done that if you like um if you have people sort of virtually sort of looking off to the side i don't know it's weird i mean so could, like the, television that's what they do so i don't i don't think it'll the, work well. the new drew barrymore show i think they're doing that way um I haven't seen it. I just think I remember reading that, so I could be wrong. I'm yeah. hoping someone will correct me if I am. Um, and there have been things that are set up to do that. Yeah, like when you see like documentaries and they'll do interviews with people, one style is they'll have them look right into the camera, but yeah. the other style, and this is more to make them comfortable when they're talking, is you, you as the questioner sit a little to the side of the camera, yeah. and, then and then you, you ask contact. the questions, and then you make eye contact with the person that you're interviewing, and then they're talking to you. They're not actually looking at the camera and and they find it a lot easier. But that's more about getting the person to be comfortable and just interview like a normal person as opposed to trying to change where they're looking. Well, it's it's also most people are easier to light and look better if you look at them with three quarters view instead of oh, straight on. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So there's a lot of lighting issues and just. Yeah. Making people look shiny, pretty. Yeah, but it's absolutely been my experience. Like, just imagine, all right? Yeah. You're, you're, I'm, I'm asking a person questions. They're looking into the camera, and yet they're not looking at me. But they dart their eyes dart over to me while they're talking and stuff. So it's, it's just so much easier to say, just look at me. Don't look at the yeah. camera. Let's just have a conversation, and then it looks fine. So yeah. Um, okay. I'm gonna drink from my skull. Yeah. I may need to go let dogs in. Yes. And how? She's in the backyard barking at the tree. I will return. Good luck with that. When my dog is... Thank you. <laughs> Three-quarter view is what the Egyptians used, I believe. Really? Is that when they... Back in ancient Egypt when they shot video? Um, yeah, it's funny. Like, when when we were doing our videos on the guide to space back in the day when, when Jay was working on them with me, we would purposefully implement one new experiment in each video that we did up until like about 200 episodes or so. There was one very, and so it was sometimes it was like, we're gonna try shooting at night and have it lit. We're gonna try shooting in direct sunlight. Uh, we're gonna try shooting, um, uh, we're going to put music over. We're going to use funny cuts. We're going to use this cut, that cut, this cut, uh, et cetera. And we just worked our way through every single thing that we'd ever seen done to try to at least be able to recreate it one item at a time and then just stick with the things that we liked. And 
And in the end, there weren't a lot of things that, that really made a difference one way or the other. Um, learning how to white balance was really important. Getting good audio quality was really important. Um, uh, with the lighting, you just need to make sure that, that the background isn't overly lit compared to you. Um, but, but apart from that, you know, there wasn't a lot of, of stuff that really mattered. But it was just going through that process to teach yourself bit by bit by bit what works, what doesn't work. It's, uh, you know, we would, I don't think we ever did any green screen. That was on the list. But um, Pal is using green screen right now. I, I am just to mess with you. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Are those your paintings? Yeah. Okay. Even the little ones? That, so this is all digitized together. That's, yeah. so those are actually uh, all either six inch or 11 inch paintings. And then they're just rescaled in Photoshop right. to create a, a gas giant in its moons. Yeah. And there are way too many stairs in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. All right. Are you, tell me when you're ready. <sighs> Let me get the notes in front of my face. Are you going to come in here and be quiet? Yeah, he's going to be quiet. Okay. I am pressing record. I Hi, Allie. Hi, also Richard. Record. Okay. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 602. <laughs> you need to say that again. <laughs> okay. You said Astronomy Cast. Did I? Yes. Sure. If you want, I'll start the recording again. I'm sure I didn't, but maybe the audience will say, yeah, you did. All right, here we go. Ready? Astronomy Cast, episode 602, New Colors of Gamma Radiation. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and with me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. Oh, man. Summer has already arrived. We've skipped spring. We've gone straight to summer. Temperatures are ludicrous here. It's just, oh, it's geez. amazing. Yeah, it's it's so funny. It's like one day, everything is just dark and dismal. And the next day, you're wondering if this is the year we buy an air conditioner. It's crazy. We're, we're having full on spring here today, but tomorrow it's supposed to snow. So I'm looking at our apple tree and what? hoping for the best right now because like it was in full bloom last week and whatever apples we're going to get have already been pollinated. Yep. And I like apples. Yeah. Yeah. Our, every, every year that some of my plants survive our winter, I'm always just shocked and surprised. I'm like, you lived? Yeah. I was expecting it to not make it through that, that winter. We had a, we've had a couple. I've got a fig tree that's not really happy with not being in the Mediterranean. But, no. but apart from that. Um, <laughs> all right. So the Earth's atmosphere protects us from a universe that is definitely trying to kill us. But it also blocks our view of the entire cosmos, like seeing X-rays and gamma radiation. Space telescopes are changing our view of the most extreme events in the universe. And we will talk about this more in a second. But first, let's have a break. And we're back. Okay, Pamela, I'm going to be honest here. Um, you put an episode on the schedule that I had absolutely no idea what it is that you were talking about. And not only that, I still have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And I feel like normally I am like a, a I don't know, a vacuum cleaner for all, every little tidbit of new space news. And yet for some reason, you snuck one past the radar that I had no idea. So... And I've decided I'm just, I'm not even going to prepare. I'm going to discover this, this with the rest of the audience together while you tell us about this entirely new color uh, that's been added to the universe. Thanks, scientists. Um, <laughs> so b before we get into the, into the additional discovery, let's start with what gamma radiation is. So gamma radiation. Um, is, is one of these terms that gets abused a great deal. Radiation is the problem. Radiation can mean two different things. It can mean either photons, just regular old colors of light traveling through space. It can mean radio waves. Um, it can also though, however, get 
used to describe high energy particles, uh, alpha particles, beta particles. These are just nuclei of atoms in the case of alpha particles. They're helium nuclei flying along at high velocities. And we call all of that stuff collectively radiation. Now, right. gamma rays are just a color of photon, a wavelength, an energy that is higher energy than x-rays. So when you shine x-rays through a human being, they get more or less stopped by your bones. They get less stopped by fleshy bits. And the ability of different parts of our anatomy to block x-rays in different amounts is incredibly useful for medicine. Now, if you crank up the, the amount of x-rays, first of all, they're going to go through you even more. And when they hit, they're going to be more dangerous. And at a certain cutoff point, we stop referring to things as x-rays. And this is entirely arbitrary. And we start calling it gamma rays. And everything at higher energies, no matter how much higher of an energy you get, everything at a higher energy, all of it, all of it right. is covered, is called gamma rays. So we go from, in the colors our eyes dealing with, breaking it down to that Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, violet, indigo, indigo, violet, rather, um, to then having the UV, A, B, C, based on, well, getting sunburns and what our, our atmosphere stops and... Then once we start getting into the useful for medicine, we have x-rays and then everything else, gamma rays, everything else. Right. And you you neglected the other part of the spectrum. We're going to well. get to that next week. So oh, next okay, week okay. we go redder. OK, OK. Wait, right. But and, and I think this was this was actually something that I didn't learn until I was in my first year of university physics. I didn't really wrap my head around it until I was actually taking university physics as part of my failed engineering career. Um, that that they're all the same thing. That yeah. radio waves, infrared, visible light, X-rays, gamma rays, they're all photons. It's just yes. they are they have different wavelengths along the electromagnetic spectrum. But you can turn one into the other. I mean, you can stretch out the wavelength of visible light and turn it into infrared. You can squeeze it together and turn it into ultraviolet. So um, the the color of the light that's coming your way is just an indication of the wavelength. And in this case, as you say, the gamma radiation are the ones that are the most, the smallest wavelength, the most squeezed together. And there's infinitely smaller wavelengths that you can, that you can have. Um, how do we detect gamma rays right now? So it, it depends on where you're detecting them. So if we go into outer space, we can directly detect them by using um, instruments. Uh, for instance, Fermi is a gamma ray space telescope, and they don't have the mirror and the lens set up like we have with optical telescopes and or the dishes that we have with radio telescopes. Gamma rays really don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> Right. And and so they have these complex internal scattering devices that basically funnel the gamma rays down onto a detector that allows you to count photons in a particular direction in space. And um, here on the surface of the planet, we are grateful to say our atmosphere blocks gamma rays. Otherwise, like we wouldn't be getting a whole lot of Spider-Man. We'd be getting a whole lot of cancer. And that's bad. Right. So what we have to do here on the surface of the planet is we have detectors like Schrankoff detectors that look for the cascading particles that get generated when these high energy photons hit our upper atmosphere. Um, and there's starting to be a larger and larger variety of these on the surface of our world detectors that are looking for essentially the children of the interactions that occur when gamma rays get stopped by our atmosphere. Right. So um, definitely need to go to space or as you say, with the Cherenkov radiation, you can see the the, I guess, an indirect 
evidence of gamma radiation striking the atmosphere yes. and causing a cascade of particles. Okay. Yes. So then what is the news? So there have been theories, guesses, hopes that we would be able to detect super high energy gamma rays that originate from whatever is generating super high energy cosmic rays. If you've gone out at night and tried to do CCD imaging for astrophotography, if you've turned your television on to a non-existent channel and it's an old school television, you'll see that static on the screen. That static is cosmic rays. Those bright splotches you sometimes get on your images uh, from your during a CCD exposure, those are cosmic rays. Or when you're an astronaut and you just close your eyes, those are Wasn't cosmic go rays. There. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's one of the most unnerving things that that astronauts will talk about that that you they close their eyes and and they can see flashes of cosmic rays hitting their retina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wasn't gonna go there. Yeah. Um, so the problem with cosmic rays is we can't, in general, figure out exactly where they're coming from because they're charged particles. Some of them we can figure out because they're coming from below us. Granite is a source of cosmic rays, by which I mean nuclear decay is going on in the Earth, generate particles as well. So you can change the amount of cosmic rays that you deal with from the ground by where you put your telescope. But as you go higher and higher up in the atmosphere, it was discovered you get more and more of these charged particles raining down on your detectors. And because they're charged, as they travel through space, they're getting their paths constantly changed by magnetic fields from stars, from our own atmosphere, from everywhere between here and where they originated. So we detect these super high energy particles, but because they're charged, we have no idea where they came from. All right, well, we're gonna continue this story in a second, but first let's take a break. And we're back. Okay, so that is the challenge. What, yes. what is the solution? So if charged particles, you can't tell where they came from because the magnetic fields move their path, Let's look for things that don't have charge. And this is where high energy photons, those gamma rays come into being because you can end up with, they're calling them pevatrons. <laughs> that, <laughs> they're, like, like if it doesn't have the name Ray in it, <laughs> I think they've missed the point, but sure. Well, I guess microwaves, radio waves, Gamma green rays, green ultraviolet ultraviolet radiation <laughs> is it so it would be pev pevatron pev pe yeah. pevatron pevatron radiation and this is it's it's for peta electron peta. volts is the amount of right okay energy in these gamma rays and They've been theorized for a long time. Um, they've been gaining more and more popularity in the 2000s as we've gotten closer to having detectors capable of seeing these things. And the excitement is that if we see them coming directly from a source, it either was generated at that source or was bounced off of that source. And what we're finding is two different families, it looks like of these pevatrons and a few really cool exceptions. So the first low energy family that we're finding is up on the Tibetan plateau, there is a high altitude observatory that is looking for the child particles created when gamma rays in our atmosphere. Right, that indirect evidence I was mentioning earlier. Exactly. Right. And they've been able to trace back these reactions to the band of our own Milky Way. And what it appears is happening is all throughout the inside of our galaxy. We didn't even know if these things were coming from inside or outside of our galaxy. That's how little we knew. What we're finding is lower energy of these high energy gamma rays are essentially getting formed when cosmic rays hit 
the gas and dust in the plane in the Milky Way. And then gamma rays are the result of this collision and they get sent flying our direction. Hmm. We live in a high energy environment. We can't see because of this atmosphere we have and all the magnetic fields around us. And now we know our galaxy is a source of high energy cosmic rays. But but you're saying this sort of they're coming from kind of that away, right? They're coming from yeah. the galaxy, but that doesn't sound specific enough. There's got to be something that's actually generating them. Can't just be the well, galaxy. And and this is where it gets frustrating because while we can say that cosmic rays hit the interstellar medium, which is densest along the plane of the galaxy. And when it hits, generates gamma rays that we then detect, you still don't quite know where those cosmic rays originated. And this is where it starts to become important to look at what instruments like Ice Cube is doing, where they're starting to look for high energy particles. And then we have additional detectors looking at gamma rays. And what we're finding is there's one supernova remnant that gave off one of these peta electron volt gamma rays. There, there's been, um, it appears, blazars are another potential source of, of these things. And this is where we have these additional populations right. that we see in the sky that are higher energy. And these higher energy sources are external to our galaxy and starting to hint at in their numbers, in their directions. It takes an angry black hole or an exploding star. And by angry, I mean actively feeding on stuff, black hole in the center of a galaxy. Um, it takes that sort of a high energy environment to generate things that have gamma rays that earn a new name, Petra. Peta, peta electron volt gamma rays. All right, we'll talk about that more in a second, but time for another break. And we're back. So one of the big mysteries that astronomers have been puzzling with is just this idea is where are these cosmic rays coming from with this amount of energy? And, you know, we've mentioned this in, in past shows that yeah. they, they know that, you know, each one comes with like the energy of a, of a baseball. They're like, they're ludicrously, you know, one particle is has a ludicrous amount of energy, um, higher than anything we can produce in the Large Hadron Collider, higher than anything we could conceivably be able to produce. And so, and we just like, I think, you know, both, you know, we talked about it before and like our knee jerk reaction, black holes, like, <laughs> right, supernova, like it's got yeah. like, there's, there, there, there aren't a lot of extreme events in the universe that can, that you can sort of go to, to try and explain this, this kind of thing. Um, so then does finding these highest energy gamma radiation linked to these highest energy cosmic rays? Is it fairly definitive now? to what we were suspecting before? So so magnetic fields are certainly to blame. Within our own galaxy, we are still struggling to figure out what all the sources are within our own galaxy, but it appears that supermassive black hole in the heart of our own system generated cosmic rays once upon a time when it was a bit more active or during periods of activity, and they're still bouncing around generating X-rays for us. And then outside of our galaxy, blazars, these are active galaxies that have massively feeding supermassive black holes in their center. And the black hole itself, it, it's, it's wrong to think that it's the magnetic field generating thing. As material tries to flow onto that black hole, angular momentum always wins and material ends up forming a spiraling disk around that supermassive black hole. And anytime you put charged material in the motion, it generates a magnetic field. Yes. More material, more charge, more magnetic field. Faster, more charge, stronger magnetic field. Stronger, faster, denser magnetic field from stronger, denser, faster material. And blazars are out there 
with these amazing jets of material that gets cascaded out of the the magnetic field along its poles and they're amazing linear accelerators essentially and with a blaze are are we staring down the jet it's close to down the jet. One of the cool right. things about blazars is you can actually see what's called superliminal motion. This is where you see something that appears to be moving faster than the speed of light. It is not actually moving faster than the speed of light. But the reason that we see this perceived faster than light motion is you have a, a jet of material with the galaxy in the center. And if we're looking at it almost straight down the barrel, but not quite, we can see the ends of both jets. And it takes the light from the further jet significantly more time to reach us. And so when we measure how fast this appears to be moving and how fast the front jet appears to be moving towards us, if we don't take into consideration the, okay, this takes longer to reach us than that, it looks like the jets are moving faster than the speed of light. Um, it's a really cool just geometry playing with our minds kind of physics, but this almost but not straight down the jet phenomena allows us to see a lot more physics than we otherwise get to see. So how do we use this? I mean, can we use this to identify potentially hidden galaxies that are maybe obscured in dust? Can we use this to probe the environment around? Can we use this to measure the magnetic field strength of black holes? What's it for? <laughs> so, so at a certain level, it's one of these things where our models for how powerful the magnetic fields in some of these environments should be say, we should be able to detect these things if we just build the right detector. These high energy particles should be out there. And so you have it on the confirming theory side of things. And then on the other side of it, we know that there's these massively high energy cosmic rays that we can't tell the origins of. And so we can understand the cosmic rays only if we understand and Bind, bind first, then understand these gamma rays. So they're basically helping us understand cosmic rays, which is something that no one originally predicted. They just happen to be out there ruining our images. Yeah. And now we're trying to figure out how to understand them and where they come from. And we're confirming the theories that said, okay, so we have cosmic rays. Where do they come from? We think they come from here. And if they do, we should also see this in this from neutral particles. Right. And so it's one picture. And so now we have um, an explanation for how the most uh, the most extreme particle accelerators in the universe, where they are, how they operate. And I, you know, I, I am looking forward to them. I mean, my favorite kinds of science results are the ones where, where somebody takes some extreme event like this, or like light echoes or something like that and goes, you know, we can tell that that this galaxy did a merger X billion years ago, because we can see the light echo of the extra super, you know, uh, supernova that were going off during this time or something, right? Yes. And so and so I can just imagine them using somehow the, you know, the gamma radiation as it's as it's impacting the areas around the black hole to reveal information about the surroundings or previous generations of times when it was a quasar before or who knows who knows now that we at least know where they're coming from which is pretty awesome and and this is another side to that multi-messenger astronomy coin where we don't just observe the sky in light anymore light helped us figure out the cosmic ray particles yeah. We now use gravity particles and light. It's a single story, unified, hopefully, by the occasional theorist. That's awesome. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you. Now, do you have some names for us this week? I do. As always, we are brought to you by you. By you. <laughs> 
um, you support Beth, who's out there keeping our website up to date, Nancy, who runs Herd over the two of us, and we sure need Nancy. Uh, you're supporting Allie, who puts together our videos. You're supporting Rich, who puts together our audio. And the, this week, I would like to thank Gregory Singleton, Joshua Adams, Matt Newbold, Paul Disney, Chris Scherhofer, G4184, Cooper, Dean McDaniel, Stephen Shewater, Father Prax, Scott Bieber, Antasaurus, Rachel Fry, Dave Lackey, Andrew Stevenson, Anton Burgess, Lee Zeeland, Smansky, Blantar, Donald E. Mundus, Gene Greenwald, Bart Flaherty, Kenneth Bryan, Sean Freeman, Blixa the Cat, uh, Glenn McDavid, Kimberly Reck, Benjamin Davies, Nalia, Niall Bruce, and Tim McMacken. Thank you so much, all of you, for everything you do that lets us do what we do. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs> Bye-bye, everyone. And, and now we save. I was almost filling up my hard drive. I had to delete a whole bunch of Man. old projects. So if we ever need them again, too bad. Uh, what did I say? 602. And now I'm gonna, I, uploading doesn't even cause a problem with my bandwidth anymore. Isn't it glorious? Yeah. Oh, Rich is going to kill me if I don't <laughs> split and flatten. There. I will re-export. Why don't you just record in mono? Um, I can't. Oh, okay. That, yeah. that would be a good reason. Yeah, the microphone is, is stereo. And so it needs me to record. So it has one track... Um, that is audio and then the other track that's empty. And it, if it doesn't do that, then it tries to balance and it halves the, the, the loudness of the audio across the two mono channels. So I have to record things in stereo because it doesn't know which of the channels to, to bring in because it's a stereo microphone. Yeah, my stereo microphone does not have that level of confusion. All technology all has that level of confusion all the time everything <laughs> is awful there we go. i generally agree with everything is all awful however my software allows me to record in mono it's chill about that yeah the it depends on the software i actually like for the longest time and i couldn't figure out what this was about my audio was much quieter than everybody yeah. else's that i was talking to yeah and so i had to I had to, and so I had to boost, artificially boost my audio, which was just making it sound like crap. And then I had to find out that that all of the software was attempting to turn this stereo microphone into mono. And I had to go, no, 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 no. Just separate the channels, play it stereo, but then only play this one track, then remix it as mono. And then that worked. And so it would be like coming in audio on one channel, nothing on the other channel, and then remix it back out as mono. And then that worked. But yeah. Oh, there you go. Rich Wilson says, oh man, I remember those days. Yeah, yeah. And it's like a super fancy microphone. I just couldn't make it do what it needed to do. And it was just like, it was all over the place. And it was like, there was like settings upon settings that I had to find that were layered on top of each other. Oh, it was misery. Anyway, people are talking about, they just saw the, uh, the helicopter press conference. Yeah. So, I mean, we know we that did it, not. We know that it flew. 90 minute press conference for oh, wow. we took off, hovered, landed. They were super excited about their helicopter. Did you see the 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 video of the project manager who had her she had her plan, her like I guess her list of what to do if it crashed? And she just no. like tore it up. She was like, "Yes!" And tore up her her list of her <laughs> fail her her failure list. And so she got That's to just awesome. keep the success list. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a great it was a great thing. Just both showed just sort of the level of preparation that, yeah. that NASA goes through, but also just the excitement of of having a list of very sad things that you have that you do, now don't have to do, which I think is right. great. 
Um, yeah, and then Crew 2 is flying. Yes. Later this week, though, isn't it? Uh, or is crew, did Crew 2 already take off and I missed it? Let's see. Today? Mm. We're both wrong. Yeah. And then the April twenty second. Okay, yeah, in three days. Um and then the big news on Friday. That was amazing. The the did you listen to it live? No, no. Okay. So so give the highlights and then I'll I'll Well, so I I mean I didn't watch it live. I was I was busy on Friday, so you know, we're kind of catching up, but um but yeah, so NASA announced who their partner is going to be, who their lunar lander is going to be. Their single lunar lander partner. Just and, one. Yeah. So remember when we were talking about the whole Blue Origins? Nope. Uh, Blue Origin is out. It's going to be the yeah. starship. So they're going to be... And, and they've got a pretty complicated way they're going to be using Starship in the stack. So they're going to be they're going to be flying an uncrewed Starship to the Lunar Gateway. They're going to fly the astronauts to the Gateway on Orion. They're going to get into the Starship, land on the moon, and then take off again from the moon and then get back into the Orion and come back. I and missed come home. the Orion part. Yeah. So they're still using they're still using Orion. <clears throat> Orion's never flown. Yeah, it has. Yeah, they flew an Orion um, a couple of of years ago on a uncrewed on an Atlas, and they actually went out past the moon. It was like, do you remember? It was like the farthest humanity has sent a human rated spacecraft. It was like two, three years ago. It was like it had. It was just getting ready to fly when we were down to see the Osiris Rex launch. I have no memory of this. None whatsoever. Oh, really? Googling is occurring. Yeah. I believe you. I have no memory of this. And I'm like, how did I like miss this? Yeah. I will. Ha I'm not finding it on a quick Google. I really? will look later. Yeah. Yeah. Orion capsule test flight. Uh, e. There you go, 2014, December 5th, 2014, EFT1. Look for that. 2014 is like four lifetimes I ago. I know, I know. There you go. It's been a long time. Okay, so let me, we'll just, we'll just read the notes here from, from Ars Technica because we're, maybe we've got the story up on Universe Today. Matt was working on it. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, this was no, we haven't read it yet. Okay. Two two years before Osiris Rex. Yeah. Uh there you go. Zephan Zephan saying Delta Four, not an Atlas. Okay, fine. Apologies. And not past the moon. Hmm. Um I feel like it did go it went out. It left far. low Earth orbit. It went low it, Earth orbit. Yeah, it was the first human rated spacecraft to go beyond low Earth above orbit. Above okay. lower yeah. Okay. Um okay, so um So a year ago, they gave the preliminary stuff to SpaceX, Dynetics, and Blue Origin. Yeah. And SpaceX's bid was half that of Dynetics and a fourth the amount of what uh, what Blue or what Blue Origin got. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then on Friday, Cho SpaceX is their sole provider. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and the audio from this is really worth going back and listening to because the journalists were like. We're just gonna ask, and we don't care how non politically correct our questions are because this is all so ludicrous. Yeah, and and there were a few moments where you could hear nothing. What? Because all the NASA people. Yeah. It was it was sadly only audio, but like in my mind's eye, I can just all imagine all the NASA people going, "I don't want to answer that. Will yeah. you answer that? Shoot, none of you will yeah. answer this. I have to answer yeah. this." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like awesome. what? Also, follow up question. <laughs> What? <laughs> just, just go listen to this. I will. I will. That's it's awesome. Amazing. Um, 
So as part of the Artemis program, SpaceX has proposed launching a modified version of its Starship vehicle to lunar orbit. Shortly afterwards, a crew of NASA astronauts would launch inside an Orion spacecraft on top of a space launch system. They would rendezvous with the Starship in lunar orbit, board the vehicle, go down to the surface. Starship would then lift off from the lunar surface and link back up with Orion, and the crew would come back to Earth in the smaller capsule. So that's the plan, is they'll send a Starship into lunar orbit, it will orbit around the moon, and then an Orion will go, will fly on the space launch system. Let me guess what's going to happen next is that they're going to get into it. I'll bet you, mark my words, um, they're going to go Crew Dragon, Falcon mm -hmm. 9 Crew Dragon to orbit, mm -hmm. transfer to Starship, Starship to the moon, back to Earth orbit, transfer back to Crew Dragon, back down to Earth. That seems like the safest yeah, route. Yeah, the, the big question is where do they choose to put the refueling station? So if the refueling station is in lunar orbit, then Dragon to that. If a uh, refueling station is in Earth low orbit. to middle Earth orbit, yeah. that's... But so I mean, it's... you can know... I mean, it feels like that's the safest route. That, that you can launch a starship, have it refuel, know that you've got a starship on the right trajectory, orbiting around the Earth, ready to go. You launch yeah. your astronauts on a Crew Dragon. A Crew Dragon is like twice the volume of an Apollo capsule. Like it's yeah. it's a beefy, it's a yeah. big space. While the, I mean, I can't even imagine the amount of space they'll have inside a, a starship. To, yeah, um, like crew, two astronauts. tennis courts. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So that's my that's my like like they're still connecting the space launch system to this system. There's no way. There's no so, way. So so I I will say one of the things that came out of this that made me feel a little bit better, the 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 new NASA administrator, uh, former Congressman Nelson, is very much an unknown to, pe to people. He's part of old space. He flew on the space shuttle. Um, he clearly remembers the Apollo age. And so there was the open question of would he embrace commercial space or would NASA really buckle down with the old federal providers? Yeah. And it looks like it's going to be whatever works most effectively will be selected, except we're still chained to Orion and SLS. <laughs> Yeah, and th that's the last link that that needs to be broken, and it will be broken. I think. Like, I think we are. This this step is is just the first big step, and they're gonna if if SpaceX can provide a soup to nuts, top to bottom, Earth to Moon yeah. solution, then then eventually they're just gonna like how many times do you want to spend two billion dollars building a rocket when SpaceX will take us there for sixty million. And, and one of the things that really caught my ear was someone asked if um, SpaceX would be allowed to launch from like Musk's new oil rig launch pads and things like that, or if they'd be confined to launching from the Cape. Um, and, and NASA's answer was essentially they can launch from wherever. And that opens up the idea also to really save fuel on taking off from closer to the equator than we can right now just because we don't have land closer to the equator that's flat enough really right but they're not going to like take one of these oil platforms down to the equator and launch off of that i mean these well, we are... have no idea what they're going to do we don't know i don't know okay someone no. knows i don't know what yeah I mean, my understanding the plan is this is going to be off the coast at boca chica or and off okay. the coast at at just to keep them so they're not so loud like they're just going to be okay. farther away from the land so it's not like they're going to be like sea launch where they float them down to the equator so cool. yeah it would be cool but um but yeah it's a it's a it's a huge step i mean it's it's funny like for all of my bravado and and ambition I wouldn't have put my money on Starship at this point when we've watched four of them explode on, you know, on landing. You're like, you want our astronauts in that? Really? So, so 
what if while we were watching this on Twitch, one of our community members, DPI 209, made me just lose it because they typed in essentially, um, I wonder if this, it, and I'm going to misquote it. It was something along the lines of, I wonder if SpaceX will be able to maintain their rate of one red per month now. Yeah. And just the idea of, okay, let's just keep blowing stuff up. I, I'm trying to be hopeful for SN15. It's a complete new version number. Um, yeah, because the safest way to, launch, to, 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 to do a new product is to completely overhaul many, many different elements simultaneously. That is not the safest way. That is, you know, anyone who's, who works in tech... Like that is going to freak you out. To this know. is the Windows 3.1 to Windows 95 jump. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. You're trying to hope that all of these different, each one could, could be a failure point and they've, they're all going to work simultaneously in the ways that you want them. No. I'm, I'm trying to be hopeful. I, me, the person who is yeah. always is going to blow up. Yeah, no, they've introduced, to be helpful. they've introduced 50 new ways that it can explode. That's what, that's what they've done. Uh, no, that's that's madness. And so, I mean, but like, clearly this has got to be a blow for for Blue Origin at this point. Like, like I think we've all been cutting Blue Origin a lot of slack. We're like, they do hops now and then. Yeah, They're watch that new cute. Shepherd. They're off to the side. Yeah, yeah. And then of course we've seen the new. You know, we've seen videos of what the new Glen is going to look like, and they've bought a yeah. ship, and they've um, for landing them on, and we've seen their their fairing size, and we know their BE four engine works great but but they, so, they've been pushed back again like now we're not going to see a test flight into 2022 at this point yeah i'm wondering now that bezos is going to be focusing more of his energy on it instead of on the primary amazon company the web portal to buying things um i'm wondering if that will affect things to have him be more hands-on I can't say what direction it would affect things, but I'm wondering if it will affect yeah. things. Like, did you see the announcement today? Um, Amazon is going to be launching their Kuiper, their version of Starlink. Oh, yeah. Gu yeah. Guess who they chose as their provider? SpaceX. No, no, they should have, oh. but they chose uh, United Launch Alliance. So that makes, that makes, I know, it makes no sense. They're going to be launching, like, if you're like Jeff Bezos owns Amazon, owns Blue Origin, obviously the right move is to launch on Blue Origin. So clearly Blue Origin is, and they would know the inside track. So clearly mm -hmm. Blue Origin is so far behind the curve that Amazon is too frightened that they're not going to be able to get their constellation into orbit until, until yeah. later. And yet well, they couldn't space, go to SpaceX because I guess the that's... The first shell of SpaceX's Starlink is done. They have shell one done. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> yeah, they're, they, are, they are now officially going to run away with it all. I mean, we've been talking mm -hmm. about this for years, and now this is, yeah. when the, this is when the running... This is what running away with everything looks like. Um, the I mean, even with the Starlink. I mean, they're now planning on putting Starlinks in cars, trucks, boats... Uh, trains, yeah. uh, cruise ships. They're going to bake cruise them ships, right thank in. God. Can you imagine getting good in and out on a cruise ship? Madness. That's, yeah. 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 They're going to yeah. bake it into all of these things. And then they're going to figure out how to miniaturize them and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all of our internet providers have been, been treating us so poorly for so many years. That they're going to learn. Yeah. They're, yeah. They'll rue the day. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. Arjona saying, wasn't SpaceX going to the moon anyway? Yeah, they were going to go. They were paying their own way to go to the moon. But I mean, yeah. in theory. Well, they, they already had the dear moon sold and planned. Um, and I'm really hoping that still flies. Um, yeah, there, there were another one of the questions that I didn't totally catch the um answer and i need to go back and listen a second time one of the questions was i uh, is nasa going to allow spacex to use uh their lunar starship for commercial launches as well 
And I mean, it may accidentally turn out that SpaceX becomes the first space tourist place. Yeah, you can be weird. I mean, the fact is, like, having them, like, you can imagine SpaceX regularly sending starships to the moon, and then one of them being used by NASA every now and then, right? But they've got this capability. Again, if you go back to it, like, it's it's the cost of fuel. Like, once these things work, and they function, they're looking at a couple of million dollars per flight to the moon. It's like buying a jet and not throwing it out every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is a this is madness. It's a it's such I cannot. If you would ask me, you know, on Thursday, what's NASA going to announce? I would have expected something far more complicated with many more partners that was going to try to sort of use all this, these pieces. And no, no, what we just got was just utter capitulation to SpaceX. <laughs> Which is, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It would be nice I to don't have know. A I'm laughing so hard I'm shaking my camera. Yeah, it would be nice um, to have a robust competition as opposed to just this, just this one company town at this point. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions about uh, the actual episode. Um, My dog is snoring. You're quieter for some reason. Did you kick your microphone or unplug it or something? No, I, I leaned back. And you're still quieter. Well, maybe, I don't know. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, let, me, let me put my face go. back where there it was. Go. Okay. Wow. It's a, clearly a big difference. Um, Beth John said, like, so someone was asking on Twitch, are there any critters that can see gamma rays? No. Because no. they wouldn't evolve to that on the surface of our world where there aren't gamma rays. Right. Um, also on Twitch, do these cosmic rays get through the atmosphere at the poles where auroras are seen? Um, they so cosmic rays cosmic don't rays get, get th- some of them get through the atmosphere, but not yeah. Many. Some of them some of them get through, and it's a function of altitude as well as magnetic field. And I honestly don't know which is the dominant factor. Um, you can't get to a super high altitude um, in Antarctica in general. Right. So I I don't know. But I can tell you what variables matter. Um, Hal McKinney asks, is there a maximum frequency wavelength gamma rays can achieve? No, that's the cool and crazy part. Just higher, smaller wavelength, higher energy. Faster frequency. Faster frequency you get in just forever. Yeah, same with same thing with radio waves, which I guess we're going to talk yeah. about next week. That that both are they're just they're everything else is in the middle of the spectrum, and those two both are the are the end caps, but they just go on forever. Yeah. All right. Well, we've reached the end of our hour, Pamela. Uh, what are you working on, and where what can people find out more? Um, right now, I, I am bouncing back and forth between working on planning out this summer's Cosmoquesticon. You can uh, figure out how to get tickets on Cosmoquest.org. Um, we are going to be doing a 1980s space party celebrating 40 years since the first launch of the space shuttle and 40 years since Voyager 2 went past Saturn. Um, and when I'm not doing that, we're putting together daily space and I'm working and writing software because that's what I do. Um, I did four interviews last week. So I got, I think three this week. So interviewing someone from James Webb, um, man, I even forget. I'll, I'll be putting up the events, but I've got my open space tonight. So if you want to come and hang out with me at five o'clock today. Uh, that's just in a couple of hours, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about all this stuff, so I clearly need to learn more about what's happening. 5 p.m. Pacific yes. for all of those of you. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for watching us. Thank you to all the moderators. Thanks to Beth for managing uh, our being the time, the master of time um, <laughs> while we were recording the episode. And, of course, thanks to Pamela for uh, bringing the brain. We will see. I now want to get Beth a shirt that says master of time on the sleeve. Sure. Well, she has to share it with Nancy. It depends. Sometimes it's Nancy is the is yeah. the master of time, and sometimes it's Beth is the master of time. But yeah, both clearly are legitimately time time lords. lords. Yep. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. We'll see you Friday. 
Yes. 